Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 215, I think, right? 215, 215, 215. No, 214. 214. Wrong again. 214. Dos, uno, cuatro, right? That's how my Spanish is going. Hope you guys are well. Rested, hydrating with that malarkey. <coughs> How you guys doing, man? Been a long time, isn't it? Right? I think it's been about 12 days exactly since my last upload. Um, I've been a bit MIA. I've been a bit incognito. I disappeared from the interwebs or from the streaming platforms and from the podcast platforms. Mostly due to my inability to wake up early in the morning and mostly due to the um, my over... Um, what do you call it? My getting snowed under at work and stuff. You know, people say that all the time, but I've officially been snowed under. I've had limited time to get... My stuff done in the morning. I had to choose between making the podcast and working out, and I chose the working out, um, which might have not been the, which probably wasn't the right choice in the end of it, because you know you have to keep this content train churning along. But you know that is what it is. So I'm back now. That's what matters. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I think um, the next kind of schedule I'm going to kind of run on, because uh, I've kind of got my first couple of weeks under my belt at my new workplace. Oh, I didn't mention to you, right? So I've got a new workplace. I've been moving around a bit this year, um, mostly due to um, the the situation that happened to the previous company I worked with in the past, you know, that um, absolute slim, slime ball, the absolute um, deplorable and, you know, despicable human being that I ex, ex- Starts at Founder was where I worked for previously, an absolutely, you know, bottom of the barrel shit stain of a person who uh, didn't know how to run a company properly, hired me with the, you know, and I'm sure he was aware that the company was going to fold within the next few months if he didn't secure funding, but hired me in order to, I don't know, maybe um, add as, you know, I I think I might have been a quota hire, you know, I think I might be one of the people that he hired just because he wanted it to look like an international team, you know, have somebody from the Middle East, have somebody from Central Europe, have somebody from Britain, have um whatever have an african there do you know what i mean i think that's what he wanted personally um looking from the outside again this is my cynical take on it but um that shit he started at founder didn't run the company well and i also have a portion of blame to it because i love to uh ascribe by the extreme ownership mantra right i, I can also as- ascribe some blame to it myself i kind of went head first into it because i was rushing out of my other job previous to that where i was kind of feeling a little bit beaten down and it's funny because <clears throat> I was just thinking about it today, like how annoyed I've been so far that I haven't been able to record a podcast because, you know, I've been so busy at work and stuff. And it's annoyed me because, you know, um, I hate the fact that sometimes work bleeds into your free time, right? It kind of takes up the time where you'll be able to do your own things um, just because, you know, of the nature of work. It requires you to come in um, super early in the morning. It requires maybe to stay in a couple of minutes later than you finish. So it's, it's eating up loads of chunks of your time that you can't necessarily get back. But what I've realized is that this is only happening to me now because I have things I'm actually doing outside of work that I'm enjoying, that are bringing me fulfillment, that are bringing me joy. And a lot of the people that I kind of, you know, take the piss out of or can't believe that they're so infatuated by work, you know, people that stay behind longer or, you know, are always going to the company drinks, always going to any company event, like they're just always there. It always makes you think like, what's well, these guys are weird, isn't it? Have, don't they have any friends? But then the older you get, the more you start to understand life, the more hobbies you pick up on the outside or business ventures or just, you know, stuff that you do in life. You start to realize, oh, no, it's not that. It's just the fact that it's very hard as an adult, right? Number one, to make friends, right? New friends, like new genuine friends, not friends that you just go out and get smashed with. I mean, friends, genuine friends that you can talk about, you know, your personal issues with, your career goals, your love interests, whatever that may be, right? Those kind of real trustworthy friends. It's hard to make those when you're on your, or when, I don't know, when you're over the age of 22, 23. So if that's difficult, it's also difficult to find new interests, to pick up a new hobby, um, to find a new social group within that new hobby. It's very difficult to do. So people tend to just to kind of, you know, go with what they know. And usually the workplace is a good equalizer. Um, I think most employers, even the shitty ones, do a good job of hiring a good range of employees. So you usually go in there, you can meet people at different stages of their life, people at different stages of their career, um, whatever it may be. So you probably got a, a good enough base to kind of latch on from from your work colleagues and you never know you might make one you know everyone's got that one or two persons at work who they kind of connect with the most they might introduce it to their friends and they kind of you know your group kind of expands out of it but i kind of realized that it's actually a blessing that i'm annoyed at work because it means that i finally found something outside of work that's bringing me joy and happiness and you know mainly with the training mainly with the podcasting mainly with the djing um the reading has always been a big um thing in my life that i'm trying to somehow figure out what to do with that whether it's kind of doing my blog post which i haven't been doing 
uh, more regularly than I wanted to, um, which is learning a language I've never, would haven't been doing as well. There's loads of things on my list I need to do, but those three things, I think, you know, the training, the running, uh, the DJing, oh, sorry, the podcasting, the running and the DJing or the training, essentially, has definitely been something that's kind of gave me a lot of joy and made the whole like work-life balance thing a really difficult question to kind of get um, grips with. But in the interest of solutions, what I'm going to do is that nowadays I'm just going to wake up earlier. I'm going to get my podcast done in the morning. Um, that means sleeping a bit early. That means, again, taking up more of my time because I like to stretch out my time at night. And try to sleep. I usually sleep at 9. No, I usually sleep at about 12, right? Half 11, 12, which is pretty late. So I might have to bring my sleeping um, forward a bit um, and then wake up a little bit earlier, about 5 or so, whatever it may be. Uh, do my podcast whatever wash wash no do my podcast go for train go to the gym or go for a run and then head off to work because then i've already got all my stuff done in the morning i don't need to kind of do anything else outside of that but yeah but apart from that i've been good man how you guys been huh how you guys been it's been absolutely sweltering here in london it's absolutely baking as you can probably see from the window on that side if you're watching the video um the sun is baking it's about what 22 degrees now let me see the weather on the my app see if i've got it right uh, it's 14 degrees today right um which is insane and then is it gonna go up later on ba, 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 ba. yeah the 22 no it's, that's down in it right is it cooler what, what what's cooler or hot i don't know doesn't matter and it's really hot it's really hot i've been wearing shorts i've been wearing t-shirts and i'm doing a damn thing what have I else i've been up to oh so i'm djing um this weekend or last week past weekend it was quite cool I went and played at the Free Compasses, you know, my favorite little boozer in Dalston. Um, I'm also going to be playing this Saturday again at the Heathcote and Star, so that's pretty cool. Um, we've been doing a Friday thing quite often now at Tappy, so I'm not sure if it's going to continue, but so far it's been pretty interesting, a pretty good learning experience, something that's kind of bringing, brought me a lot of education in terms of how I DJ and how I kind of um, cultivate a set or put together a set list and how I then translate that into a bar pub where people don't necessarily dare to see you. It's, all, it's been a really good education. I'm really grateful for that. And of course, you know, playing in these places on Saturdays has been a really good um, thing too. But I've been thinking now, because I've been playing a year, uh, or a year and a half, maybe coming up to two years now. Yeah, a year and a half, sorry, coming up um, at Heathcote and Star and those other two places, um, the kind of places where I play in a more of, a, a more of an affluent area. I think I'm going to have to start really reconsidering um, the rates that I charge. Um, again, it's something that I'm a bit hesitant to do because I think a lot of people, as a lot of people are, because you're afraid it might, I'm getting my coffee here, because you're afraid it might damage your further bookings, right? People might just be put off by it, like, the, you know, in my head, I might think I'm getting booked because I'm, I play really well out of the people that usually play, but then it might be because I'm one of the better ones who are also cheap, right? So once you start raising your prices, all of a sudden you start losing clients, but the the, the thinking is that what you, when, you, when you raise your prices, you don't need to rely on so many clients, right? Um, as You know, if you, if you raise your prices by a factor of 100 or 200%, you don't need to have as many clients on your book to kind of sustain yourself or to, you know, keep the lights on, whatever it may be. But again, a lot of risk involved in that. But um, what is life without taking a bit of risk? So that's something I'm going to think about in the next few days or the next few months and decide what I want to do. Apart from that, think of doing a Berghain trip uh, or a Berlin trip specifically, but, you know, mostly to go to Berghain. Um, if I don't get into Berghain, which hasn't happened in a while, actually, um, I've been I've been successful the last few times. The only time I wasn't successful was when I went with a group of boys. So that kind of says most of the story there. Um, I think I'm going to... Yeah, if I don't get into Berghain, I'll probably do Grease Mueller because I've heard rumours on the interwebs that I suppose they're going to close soon. I think I think it's the rumours started because of... Uh, the unfounded rumours so far because no one's really spoken about it from the industry, but supposedly the, the the building across the road or somewhere near Grease Mueller is getting sold up to developers. And, you know, the common thinking is that once one building gets sold up to a developer... That, that developer puts in a complaint about the unsightly nature of the building across the road which has been there from the beginning which leads to the whole um gentrification debate and then that place has to close down right it's a standard process so that's what people are going by but i don't know i, I get the feeling that bar 25 was the last kind of great um berlin club that closed i'm not sure if they closed because of council pressure or because the the owners just had enough and kind of wanted to put their their feet up i guess because that's something you 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 heard of i heard of a lot through um Hiroshi Fujiwara, right? He would, and Nigo and those kind of guys, they would always, you know, state that they would make a brand and then they would kill it instantly, right? When They'd kill it whenever they thought it ran out of legs, right? And the, or, or, the whole idea, ho, ha, 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 the whole idea behind that 
was that um, they went to build a bit, a build a bit of mystique around the brand because everyone loves a brand that doesn't exist anymore, right? Everyone loves to kind of like wear a brand that you can't get a hold of anymore, right? You only have to look at Supreme and you know the lack of cool factor associated with that to see how that kind of works. So um, Hiroshi Fujiwara and those kind of dudes from the Japan scene would kind of the Tokyo scene, sorry, would make a brand and then kill it soon after, right? After it kind of run its experiment in order to kind of give it a legendary status. And I guess you could do the same thing with a club, right? You could start a club, close it. And then everyone could think, oh my God, that was such a great time. That's what I would have, that's what I thought should have happened with the alibi. I think, again, maybe it's not my decision. And I'm not, um, it's not my, of course, not my decision, but I'm not the businessman there. But I think the alibi would have done really well if they decided to close it when it was good, during its kind of downturn instead of kind of chip, like, you know, longing it out and just keep on grinding on. Eventually, the council kind of, you know, uh, put in a position where they had to close it. But that would have, it, that would have worked out really well if they just closed it. And then, um, decided and then kind of decided to kind of take the name into different places right and then promote it that way i think that would have worked really cool people would have remembered all the good times they had there but again you know everyone does their things differently um yeah that's it for me so far i went to paris i told you about that right i went to paris paris was fucking fun i loved that um i push i mentioned that on our pre podcast but that was a lot of fun i saw the hype around that i got the hype there um makes a lot of sense um what has i been doing that's about it really isn't it I've been training a bunch. I ran back from work yesterday, which was Monday morning, Monday evening, sorry. I ran back about four and a half miles from where I work near the centre of London. And then, yeah, kind of ran back and that was quite cool. Um, annoying sometimes because I think I'm going to do it every Monday because just kind of get my system running. But I find running back quite annoying from work. Similar, I find running back from work similar to ordering... Oh, don't, this is not level, is it? I find it as annoying as ordering something from Amazon or whatever website from work right i'm not i'm not sure about you guys but i always get you know that annoying situation where people come up to you and oh my god what is it what did you order oh and they start creaming their pants over it and making a big deal out of it i hate that kind of like spectacle same with the running it from home people always are surprised or shocked that i'm doing it and it's not that big of a deal really isn't it right i think any runner has run four miles in a week right or in a day right it's not a big deal to put that one into one run no big deal either and you have to get home so there's a there's a motivation there because you want to get home and sleep and shit and again, everyone does it from that sort of area where I'm working. It's not like I'm, I'm the only person doing the thing that I'm doing. So it kind of makes it, you know, it kind of makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. Sometimes, anyway. Um, just That's just me. I would prefer to do it another way. But, you know, that's the only way that I can get that real long of a run in. And I don't really want to do it before work and then have to sit down the whole day, right? That's isn't the, that isn't the lick either. I think if I was working a job that required me to stand up or if I was like some kind of business development manager and I was moving around town a lot, I think running in the morning would be fine. But the fact that I'm sitting in a chair for like, you know, seven and a half hours or something isn't really the good way to go about things, in my opinion, the girls. Um, anyway, um, let's enough about that. Let's get into some topics because, you know, I've been away for a while and I want to get into some things I want to speak about. Some of this stuff might have been dated already, but, you know, who cares, man? Internet news continues to live on. You know what we're going to do, actually? We're going to go straight into just talking about loads of streetwear stuff because I think that might be a good way to kind of, you know, um, get on the thing. So, here we go, number one. Number one, we've got this um, Kif and Tukorni shoe, right? Kif, 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 Kif. Ronnie, Fake, and the Kif Empire. They've they've got a store here in London. Um, again, you know, the, the Kif story has been told many, many times. I don't need to tell you guys anything about it. Um, a really strong business. A really strong um, visionary at the helm in Ronnie, right? Someone that's been able to steer the ship um, through really murky waters or, I don't know, rough waters. I think there was a period in time where Kif wasn't really the core brand, right? People kind of shit on him a little bit. Um, there was a period of time people t- took the piss out of the collaborations, you know, talking about, you know, only Filipino sneaker infused. That's kind of where the shoes and shit. It didn't have a cool cachet, but somehow or the other, he's kind of rid the wave, been able to navigate out of that mer- out of those stormy waters and somehow he's become like, I don't know, like a state, like, I, I kind of look at Kif like Champion, if that, if that makes any sense, right? They remind me of Champion. They're just like a solid brand. Well, Champion nowadays, right? And since, the revi- re- since the revitalization, since it's been revitalized or revived since, yeah, in a new era. I guess Champion back in the day was mostly a thing for the heads, right? People used to buy Champion reverse sweep sweats even before Supreme was doing it, right? Um, they were just, you know, it was a thing in the industry. But, I think Kif were Kif have basically established himself as a champion of that kind of sort, right? Because they make really good, heavy, heavy sweats, right? Good quality, basics, um, nice t-shirts, and just 
generally have a good eye for detail. But one thing I think is really underrated about Kif's approach to anything is their sneaker collaborations. And it's, these Sikornis are good uh, um, episodes of it, right? I've never heard the Sikorni model, I've got to be honest, and I'm a sneakerhead. And I'll consider myself a, a sneakerhead in the purest sense of the word where, you know, I'd go out and seek out trainers that no one else is actually wearing, not just buying the thing that appears on the you know, on the most, um, not, not, not buying only the thing on StockX that's like the most uh, highly sold or highly coveted, but actually going out and buying sneakers that no one is actually wearing and making them cool, right? That's the whole aspect of being a sneakerhead. One aspect of being a sneakerhead. So what I really appreciate about Kip is that they're able to um, do collaborations with companies that aren't necessarily quote-unquote cool, right? Um, or aren't hype beast friendly, right? Because, you know, you're not really going to resell these to a huge swath of people. It's de definitely for a niche, niche, niche environment, niche, niche, niche audience. But they're also able to kind of bring shoes back, like kind of revive them. And that's what I remember Pata doing back in the day. I remember Sawbox doing a lot with the New Balance the, um, collaboration, even Crooked Tongues back in the day. Football Choice do that as well. Taking models that weren't really popular at the time and then kind of bringing them back into the cultural conversation and these Sikorni and Kif shoes are amazing right so this this is an article from Hypebeast it says Kif joins Sikorni to revive a white out grid web runner right again I've never heard of this shoe in my life grid web runner um, essentially a kind of dad shoe model ish kind of shoe I love the little arc here in the middle uh, sort of like plastic arc I'm assuming it's something to do with about the walking in terms of the heel and toe which probably isn't the best way to walk but you know less said about that the better um, a very really nice upper. It's got this sort of like weird. I'm not sure if it's a two tone uh, Sukorni logo there. At first, I thought it was iridescent or gel sort of logo, but it isn't, which probably make it look, look, look a little bit cheaper. But I quite like the look of that there. And again, just a really nice model. I quite like how that kind of, you know, arches there. Just kind of see completely through it. That looks pretty cool. And again, a model that you don't really see um, too often and something that only Kif can really do in that respect. And again, just a really clever take on the shoe. I love how it looks. Um, again, I'd probably prefer a push. I'd probably say I would go for the, you know, I'd probably go for the all white pair. I like the all white pair. There's nothing that quite nice about that. It's completely translucent. It kind of looks see-through. It's so translucent, right? I'm not sure how they got that pearly white. There is real, there's a real science in achieving the perfect white for a sneaker collaboration, right? Or am I not talking sense? Like that kind of pearly off-whitey kind of white color. I saw it. A lot with the Mars Yard that I've got right over here from Tom Sachs. You remember these? Let me get this screen back up. So with the Mars Yard, right? Let me get this back up here so you can see. But with the Mars Yard, that I think it even started maybe with, a, with another shoe, maybe um, uh, Virgil's um, um, Air Force Ones, the complex ones, right? For the complex con. You know, the ones that he, he the, the, the ones that weren't sold to GR. But I remember this being a thing, right? This kind of like, kind of off whitey sort of like, chalky white sole that picks up dirt again that's a real science or white and then again this mesh used to be white but it's obviously got pretty fucked up but it's a real science to achieving that kind of white color um it's different to like the white you maybe see on like a regular air force one right um which kind of this is a bit more of a plasticky kind of shape but i like the idea that a lot of these brands are starting to really experiment with how they implement white in their trainers again maybe it's me geeking out and thinking of way too much into a topic but i think there is definitely an approach that they've done to it that's kind of achieve this kind of weird pearly white kind of color again i think with these shoes you just get standard white on the sole so they're definitely a bit more of a flexi shoe but i really like it um different mix of materials i'm not sure if that's a suede on the upper there but i really like them i think this of all white color it looks amazing it reminds me of a really classic tennis shoe from back in the day but again so corny not a brand that i would consider the most coolest or hit brand in the world or for kids nowadays i wouldn't have a problem wearing it because I, I like to wear actual trainers but um, again, I'm I, I'm I'm happy that they're kind of going with this kind of model. And again, as you can see with this model wearing them, they look flipping amazing, man. I really like them. Look at them in hand; they look beautiful. No, such a nice shoe there. Um, it's a corny shoe from from Ronnie Fag, a classic. I really again, um, not a lot of people give them credit enough for the collaborations that they do make. But again, these are uh, these are were out last week, June twenty eighth. So if you if you're out there and you want a pair of shoes that aren't the most hype shoes in the world, but also aren't you know. Everyone's wearing technos. Everyone's wearing the same old shoes. Everyone's wearing those big fat feelers that are fucking butters. If you're a girl and you're out and you want to get something that's a bit different, um, you know, grab these, man. Again, you'll be the first to wear them. It's, it's not something that everyone's going to be wearing. And essentially, you're buying into an establishment that really knows, that really kind of caters to sneakerheads, right? They're not out here trying to just make the most hypey shoe of the world. They're actually trying to provide people with shoes that are going to actually uh, serve a function in their wardrobe. So definitely recommend you check that out. Um, DC Cornies by um, Kif out now and all your Kif retailers on that malarkey. Ba, 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 ba. 
next on the list what else do we have here da, 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 da. balenciaga plastic bags um so balenciaga and barney's are giving away these plastic bags which i would very much love uh balenciaga and barney's give away the same of delhi plastic bags for pride month um and pride month has been a weird sort of time right i don't know pride month started I don't know if this is a, it's a, I don't know, again, internet is weird because you only notice things when you notice things. So I don't know if this is something that I've only noticed because I've been paying attention, but I never, it never was a pride month. It was a pride week, but I don't know. I guess that's extended. I guess it's just a, a symptom of our everyday life, right? I'm sure we will have friends who do that whole birthday week sort of bullshit that they do, right? Where they, you know, somehow employ you to go out with them every single day in order to celebrate their birthday, right? So selfish. But now pride has definitely been commoditized to the point where I, I'm not too sure. I'm, I wonder what the gay community actually think of it, right? It's been commercialized in a way where you now have MS, you know, um, slapping the LGBTQ, LGBTQ um, flag all across their products and mostly just as a corporate exercise, right? Because no one wants to get caught with their pants down. No pun intended. Everyone just wants to make sure they protect their back. So they're not really investing um, into any infrastructure that's is in and around the LGBT community, whether it's um, harm prevention, whether it's sexual health, whether it's just, I don't know, helping um some people with their civil partnership document uh documentations and supporting those charities it's just basically a way just to kind of you know market yourself and position yourself next to a movement or a collection of people who you feel are advancing culture in some way shape or form so it's a little bit hollow but again you know these are corporate companies and corporate companies will corporate company in it i guess so no surprise there but again these pla- blends are perfect buyers because i'm a big little freak when it comes to um, Demna and everything he does at, at Balenciaga, I would actually really like a, one of these. The sustainable argument um, is a bit weird, really, in general. Um, I'm not too sure. I think these are probably some recyclables, probably out of sustainable, right, I'm assuming. It should be in 17th there, past many stockists, love is everyone, da, 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 da. I'm not too sure. Anyway, yeah, it doesn't really say what exactly, but I'm assuming it's sustainable because they can be recycled or they can just be reused for other things. Um, again, this is like, um, do you remember back in the day when I, I used to buy these Japanese magazines, right, from the Japan Center in um, Pigley Circus, whatever it may have been. And, you know, that was back in the day when I didn't have the access to all the stuff online or I didn't know where to order it from. You pay like 10 to 20 pounds for like Boon or those kind of magazines, right? And um, usually they come with a free gift. So there'll be like a tote bag in there from Neighborhood or like from Bounty Hunter. There'd be like um, a wallet from Double Tap or something like just a shit. He's kind of merchandise stuff. But it was such a clever thing because those kind of little bits and pieces allowed you to buy into the brand. Again, this was like their, this was like their, this was like their um, diffusion line before diffusion lines even existed, right? So it would be a Double Tap's wallet, but it'd just be like a, a little green olive wallet thing that he probably bought from some wholesaler and just slapped his logo on the side of it, right? There'll be some design to it a little bit, but not really that much consideration given into it. And especially the Bounty Hunter uh, toes I had, they were fucking tiny as fuck, right? Really small straps, whatever it may be. But again, you just felt, it felt really special, right? But I don't know nowadays if people are have the same sort of thinking when it comes to these sort of plastic bags or these sort of things on Blend Shark and these kind of, because I guess fashion being commoditized is such a point now where Maybe it's not as special as it once was. And maybe, again, with people being more aware or being more active in their sustainability movement or what they're pushing or different brands that they're kind of buying into, you know, you have to look at your office to look across the aisles of your office to see the amount of people that have those um, metal flasks that they kind of fill up water with, right? To see that people are really taking the sustainability thing quite seriously, especially young people. So I don't know whether or not this kind of plastic bag for would fall flat in that kind of audience. But again, for a fashion freak like me, and for somebody that's a big fan of Demna and everything that he does, I would just buy into it because of that, right? I want a little bit of piece of whatever he's making in that regard. Um, and just as a fan of the brand as well, just as an archive piece, to have a plastic bag in your fucking archive is pretty cool, I think, in, t- in the mix of all the other stuff you'll probably have. So again, I recommend you check it out. Um, it's commenced to be available, the whole of Pride. Pride's finished now, right? I'm pretty sure, isn't it? It's the whole of June, isn't it? Um, yeah, so it's, pre- it's finished on the whole of June now, so it's probably over. But yeah, something I saw that I thought was quite interesting. Um, you know, free plastic bags during Gay Pride Month. I'm not sure what plastic has to do with bag. Maybe it's something subversive as well with the whole plastic bag thing, right? With gay culture. I wonder. Hmm. <laughs> um, that was quite interesting too. What, next year? We've got the Reebok C event in New York. I saw here on Hype Bees, which looks very interesting. Um, so this model has been popularized mostly by, I would say, Jown, right? Interesting that Reebok is interesting, right? I think Adidas has done this too. 
I remember seeing, right? Um, let me see if I can find it here before I kind of speak about why I want to speak about. Buh, 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 buh. Reebok C Vintage. Okay. So, um, where is it? It was like a white, it was like a green, that's the one. There's a greeny color, not a blue, green. So, um, let me, let me, let me speak and let's see if I'm, I'm, I'm right on this, right? I don't know if I am right, but hopefully I've got some kind of influence that I can kind of expound on and we can see how it goes. Uh, images, get it up on there. Okay, cool. All right, cool. So here we go, right? So, um, Reebok C event in New York, right? This is a very interesting story because, again, I've done, I'm not sure. This is probably the kind of activations that I would like to be part of, right? It's a little bit more interesting, a little bit more of a challenge. It's not the quote unquote cool brand that everyone is kind of in tune with. It's something that needs a bit of work to kind of get started. So, this is, this is an article from Hype Beast, of course, as per usual. Um, it's an event for the new Reebok C that came out, or that's come out recently. Um, they had a little pop up event in New York City for the for the shoe. The first thing that struck me first about the whole thing is that they had it in New York, right? Reebok has, for me, quintessentially been a European, specifically a UK brand. Um, I know for a long, long time um, they had that space um, just off Curtain Road, I think, that they were trying to kind of use as a kind of, you know, co-working, meeting, um, energy, marketing, uh, marketing energy sort of campus. I don't know, something to kind of like get the influences around the town to kind of like, you know, get enthusiastic about Reebok. But it never really seemed to kind of pick up any traction, right? I'm not sure if they did a collaboration with Palace because I've, I've, I'm sure those Palace kind of wankers were kind of wanting to be part of that kind of Reebok thing, right? Because they, they like wearing track suits and wearing Reeboks in order to pretend that they're perpetuating some working class um, epitaph, whatever it may be. But I, I remember that they were trying everything they could, right, to kind of make Reebok cool. They never really seemed to like hit. Then um, there were rumors that they were going to bring out the um, Reebok workouts, you know, the kind of with the icy soul, the ones that were made kind of famous by Wiley and Craig Titch back in the day. Um, then randomly Rick Ross died wearing a pair. Then that Reebok deal kind of went flat. Then they came out kind of on the sly and the kind of the traction didn't really take anywhere. And I honestly thought that that model, that Reebok classic with the sort of ridge soul and the icy soul was going to be the model that was going to really kind of push them back into the cultural conversation. But it never really kind of worked out that way. So they were kind of fumbling around trying to figure out what was going to work. I guess on the performance side of things, they've got that kind of locked in place with the Met, with the Metcons or no, the Metcons. Uh, the um, what are, what what are the Reebok shoes called? It's just a bad actually a thing, you know. I don't remember what they're called, but those CrossFit shoes that Reebok make, right? They're doing quite well there. But I guess Nike also in that scene too because they've got the Metcons that are now being you know super popular with a lot of the CrossFit athletes. So Reebok are in a bit of a tricky situation. Um, hasn't been quite worked out for them in Europe, although they have like a you know recurring customers. They have people that are loyal to a brand that buy all the time. You only have to go to parts of South London where all the arts universities are to see kids um, wearing Reebok classics all day, every day, right? White Reebok classics with white socks, black jeans. It's a standard kind of hipster art student kind of motif, which I'm surprised they haven't really kind of tapped into. But again, maybe there's something coming up in there in the future. You see a lot of Goldsmith students uh, wearing those kind of stuff, like a lot of the RCA students are wearing that kind of stuff. So. Again, really popular in that scene. Um, so, I guess because of that, they decided to then kind of probably seek other ventures and kind of go around the world and see that kind of thing, right? And what I saw happening first is that they brought back this Reebok C model, which I'm not really familiar with previously, right? I'm not really a Reebok aficionado. I don't really know too much about them. Like I said before, I grew up in a working class, um, a working class environment, a working class neighborhood with some very questionable characters who support some very questionable politics. And most of those people used to wear Reebok Classics. So for me, Reebok Classics has a bit of a tainted smell towards it, right? You know, you don't have to get rushed certain times by a group of skinners wearing Reebok Classics to think, you know, I'm never going to wear that shoe again. But my personal experience aside, what I've noticed is that outside of the world, everyone kind of sees it differently, right? And they decided to kind of reissue this model called the Reebok C. Number one, the first time I saw it was this colorway here, right? I'm going to get up on here on the screen for you guys to see. So I saw this colorway here first, right? So an interesting way to roll out a product. They brought back this kind of OG colorway. It's sort of like all white with kind of green um, details, right? Green on the Reebok side of there. A nice kind of trans, a kind of off-white sole, which I mentioned previously. Which again, I, I love how brands are kind of trying to bring back these old school vintage shoes or, you know, 80s, 70s, whatever runners that they, or technical workout shoes they make back in the day. And still trying to reiterate them in the same kind of color scheme. That's basically why we want them. 
when you saw when we used to find old school vintage scans of shoes online at forums that's the thing that really grabbed our attention was how flat this is how was how um flat kind of parallel to the floor the silhouette was right a really nice flat silhouette now this kind of banana foot nonsense that you get with modern shoes uh really clean colors and really nice application of color of color right distribution colorways are really good back in the day as opposed to now they just you know they just kind of put them into a, a randomizer and splash whatever colors they want on top of them but they reissued, reissued them in this kind of original colorway. Um, I didn't really see too much fanfare. Again, this is my own recognition. I'm not sure if this is actually true, but I do remember it going this way. It, these these originally come out, and then to kind of burst, boost the, the interest again, because I don't think these really hit as well as they could, they then decided to um, collaborate with Jown, right? Um, from obviously um, Justin Sordon from the very popular or influential mood board uh, Jown. And again, I thought this was a genius collaboration because if you know anything about Jound or Justin Sorn, this is a very minimalistic approach to design and aesthetics. Um, he's done collaborations, I think, with New Balance or a New Balance type shoe done previously that has the same sort of kind of look towards it. There are pictures I think he posted back in the day of um, Steve Jobs wearing those kind of Apple um, workout kind of, they kind of look similar to the, to this, to, to these kind of models, right? Um, uh, to Reebok C. They're sort of like an, a workout shoe. I don't know what they were, but there was an Apple trainer that came out back in the day that they kind of, you know, a lot of kind of those kind of design people used to see as a kind of, um, you know, used to put them up on a, on a plimp. So he decided to take inspiration from that shoe and reapply it in this Reebok C model. And again, done really well, tumbled leather, all white, um, great accents, just really classic and sleek design with Jan written on the inside. And these sold out really well. They had a pop-up shop in Montreal that was kind of, you know, harking back to the old school days of sportswear shops and um, loads of magazines and stuff were sold there too. So it did really, really well. And again, these kind of sold amazingly well, right? So they kind of, in my experience, I think that they launched them first um, in this sort of model, right? You got this model first from them. Let's close that bit. Um, that didn't really maybe hit as well as they kind of helped it would have, right? The kind of OG vintage shoe. Then they decided to launch with an influencer who was very influential in that space who kind of has a lot of, you know, cachet with a lot of that kind of customer. And then they decided to then do an influencer um, campaign in New York City to launch it again, which I thought, again, very, very clever way of kind of doing marketing overall. Um, so they relaunched it again in New York City. Um, I'm, I guess it's just a standard sort of thing. Uh, the footwear brand invited attendees to join the club and not to the classic iconic sneaker in this latest campaign, which started a new class of creative, blah, blah, blah. Photographer and ambassador of aesthetics, Adriana Raquel. Really? Okay, that's awesome. It's a good title to read book, isn't it? Stylist and secretary of style, Taylor Okata. That's awesome. Music and VIP of vibes, Nick Hakim. All outfitted in the latest Reebok fits. Okay, that's pretty cool. So they've got a, a little crew of people that are kind of trying to push it out, right? Um... Set, uh, set inside Lil's um, Victorian establishment, the event turned a typical country club aesthetic to its head. It was set by DJ Ryan Trinidad, themed cocktails, Polaroid portrait, standard kind of influencer marketing campaign. But again, I like the rollout. The the, the event itself is a bit, you know, meh because it's a standard thing. You've got DJs, influencers, you know, drinks, whatever it may be. But I like the fact that it was put out as a GR. Didn't really hit as well as it could. Went back to, because they really trusted the model. No, there's some, definitely something into this. Launched it with Justin Saunders at Jound. That really hit and went viral. Then came out again with this event and then kind of, you know, kind of carried it around again. So again, really long-term thinking about the whole model. But it looks looks pretty cool. I think a lot of people are going to start wearing this. I think overall, this tracks so again. Like it, Reebok, they should really do stuff. I don't know. Would I think a Reebok concept space such as this, right? Like in, similar to 1948 that sold this sort of stuff, like this track that this girl's wearing, sort of like, you know, harkens back to, do you remember the old school chili top? Do you remember that chili top? Uh, chili from the World Cup, the Reebok top that I love that Marcelo Salas used to wear back in the day. My favorite, right? This top here, Marcelo Salas uh, chili, right? Reebok, right? Do you remember this? Like in the World Cup back in the day, he looked fucking stunning. This, this is one of my favorite kits of all time. Um, I'll get up on here on the screen. Do you remember this kit? If Reebok relaunched us, re were able to redo, relaunch, or were able to open a kind of concept store that sold archive pieces back in the day, this is something I'd buy in a heartbeat, right? They relaunched all the old school Reebok tops they did in football. Look at that. Look how fucking good that looks. Red and white with a sort of Reebok swish on the top of it. That looks fucking stunning, doesn't it, right? So stuff like that will look really, really great. Um, again, let's go back to the Reebok thing. So yeah, you got this. I think that will work really cool. But again, what do I know? Uh, so you've got the Reebok event here. Loads of trendy influencers doing their influencer thing, which, you know, is the thing. Got a full orchestra here playing music. Everyone decked out in the Reebok, of course, as per usual. A big queue. Oh, no, I like the little edit there. So, again, I remember seeing those. They dropped the fucking horribly. People don't. Why do people lace up their trainers, man? Lace them up properly. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. 
But again, what do I know? Again, cool event so far. Um, but by the looks of it, I like that little tote bag. So it looks pretty nice. Um, again, I like to see people wearing these more often. Again, it's not not the hype shoe of the century. It's not something you see influencers wearing. But again, I say like I say all the time, like if you really want to cultivate your own style, you really have to kind of earmark shoes and apparel that you kind of can make your own or kind of fit your overall aesthetic and then kind of just lean into it and keep buying it photograph yourself put it up on social media those kind of things just put your stamp on it and then kind of dictate trends that way as opposed to just buying into what everyone else is buying into and just wearing those things again and again and again like you know for instance with me and these wave runners or these 700s i fucking love them right i've been wearing them every single day beating them into the ground not because they're trendy or because they're cool just because it's my favorite shoe really and it suits my kind of aesthetic and what i kind of wear they're big they're clunky and they kind of go with most everything that I'm wearing. So I think we used to do that more often than just wearing. Because now that you see people just wearing stuff because it's just the wear. You know, like, they just wear stuff because it's the it's the brand as opposed to it fitting into an outfit, which is annoying. But, you know, everyone's got their thing, I guess. But anyway, um, this Reebok C event from in New York looked really cool. Um, I love the titles they gave to all the influencers. You know, what they call them here. Ambassador Aesthetics. I quite like that. Imagine having that on your business cards. That's pretty cool. Um uh and secretary of style and music and vip of vibes that's pretty nice as well so yeah definitely recommend you check it out <laughs> look at the back they've got a kid here wearing mx 98s well, no 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 and air force ones here naughty naughty oh no the, the, that's an attendee okay i thought somebody in the, in the actual musician group probably not cool but good to see you regardless um reebok really doing the good thing there how they're marketing it really cool approach um i'm hopefully hopefully the reebok c picks up because again like, like i said i'm not really a fan of reebok but i really love that model i think it's a really underrated model i think it's really versatile that goes with most outfits and kind of again can really traverse different sort of scenes and cultural uh touch points so definitely recommend you check that out if you're that way inclined what else we got here on the list we've got to keep keep it moving because we've got to go soon ba 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 Oh, this article from Mix Mag looks free. Awesome. Let's go here. Uh, new report finds ecstasy and cocaine less harmful than alcohol. I'm not sure if this is true. And this is just propaganda. I wouldn't necessarily want to test this in that reluctant. But this is an article from Mix Mag. It says the following. A report by the Global Commission of Drug Policy has found that illegal substances like ecstasy and cocaine can have less damaging effects on individuals and communities than tobacco and alcohol. Huh. How do you take that first line? It looks like it have less damaging effects. I guess because most, you know, um, what do you call it? Antisocial behavior or domestic violence disputes are based, stem from alcohol abuse, right? As opposed to people getting on ecstasy and cocaine. Because I guess the fact that ecstasy and cocaine is so hard to get hold of in comparison to alcohol, right? You know, you can get hold of those things because people get hold of them. But you have to, you know, know somebody to get a hold of them. And whereas alcohol, you can just pop into any shop. Most... Um, residential areas have a 24-hour license or a 24-hour license a 24 a 24-hour off license or they have a store that's open quite late at night where you can purchase alcohol from so i'm assuming that kind of might play into it but let's read it on um as a result they have called for reclassification of certain drugs that reflects their actual social risk which i'm, I'm a big fan of the global commission on drug policy is made up of 14 ex-government officials together they condemned the incoherence the incoherence and inconsistency of harsh drug laws that are based on unreliable and scientifically dubious methods that arbitrarily punish the use of some substances more strongly than others the group found that the current distinction between illegal and legal substances is not economically based on pharmaceutical research it also distributed distorted dist distorted by the feeds into the moral morally charged perceptions about presumed good and evil they are pushing governments to reconsider classification I i'm a big fan of that right because i think i've spoken about it with my friends as well uh, about it like it's annoying how baby we are in society right where we can't decide what we can take or not take the government sort of decides for us and kind of regulates in that regard, which is annoying. And then you have to look at places like Berlin, which I go on about a lot on here. I understand it's boring, it's annoying. But please excuse me. But you know, I could, you know, I could throw a stone at a club, you know, within a five mile radius where most of the people in that establishment are off their heads on something, right? They're all doing some kind of drugs, right? And I can really count on one hand, if not no, not count at all, the amount of times I've seen a fight kick off at, in the Berlin club. It doesn't happen. It just does not happen. People just don't do that sort of thing. Um, people go there with a real um, ease, a real kind of um, sense of exploration. They want they're open to new experiences, meet new people. And again, I think the drugs in some regard enhance that experience. Um, what you do find in a lot of Berlin clubs is probably less drinking and more drug taking than most clubs, I'd say, on average. I'm not sure how that works out. I'm not sure how you can compare it. If you could maybe say the amount of 
alcohol they get through in a week. I'm sure there's bars. I'm sure bar managers know how to measure that, right? There's a way to measure how much alcohol is being consumed in a general week, in a given week, sorry, um, from the punters and stuff. But all in all, I think, from my experience, that most Berlin, most Berlin clubs probably have people taking more drugs than they are drinking. And again, I've not seen any trouble. The trouble that I've always seen, especially in the UK, which is probably not a good, it's a probably a false equivalency, is that in our bars in the UK, they don't really open that long, right? So let's say a nightclub. A nightclub is open until 1, 12, 2 a.m. Most people like to go to a nightclub at 10, right? So already you're already, you know, you've already got only four hours or so to kind of party and kind of get into the kind of flow of things. And then by that time you get chucked out right on time, um, right, you know, on the, right, uh, right when the clock starts, strikes one or two, and you're kind of thrown out into the streets, um, what, uh, over intoxicated um, and looking for trouble. And that kind of is what sparks it. And I've always kind of said that a good thing would probably be to, to alleviate some of those issues, especially for the cities, would be to open up loads of different venues similar to what we have in Fold in Camden Town in, you know, northwest and south of London. So you'd have a one location in each area of London where people could go and party until the late hours of the night. And it doesn't mean you're going to get in. It doesn't mean you're going to want to go. But there is an option for you to go, right? It's like, you remember when you were out back in the day and someone suggests to you, oh, let's go to Egg. And you're endorsing and you'd be like, oh, it's too far, isn't it? Because you know it's the only place that's open until 6 or 7. But if you had somewhere near near enough to east where you could go to, I think, you know, Dorsters County isn't that far. It's probably like 40 minutes you can get there. So you can go and party if you want to. Or you can go party somewhere in South. Maybe they had a location in Camberwell or in Croydon or in Peckham or in New Gross. You can do the same thing in Stanmore, wherever it may be, in West London. And you do the same thing in North. I think North I already got it with the cause and a few other places there too. And that would really alleviate some of the pain in some of these places and bars and clubs. But at the moment, especially in pubs, um, you've got people starting drinking really early because they want to get the most amount of time in. So they start at four or after work and then they get hammered all the way until 12. So six hours of drinking. And, you know, by that time, you're already sloshed out of your mind. So, you know, or any kind of violence or harmful behavior is going to come off the back of that in general. Um, you know, I've seen fights kick off in smoking areas, kick off in queues, kick off in the toilets and bars and pubs in the UK. But in, honestly, in all my years of partying in Berlin, I've not seen one fight kick off in any shape or form in that kind of environment. People just don't allow it. It's not something, it's not something that actually happens in those kind of environments. People are very good to kind of squash those things. Hey, look, it's not, and it is a real community aspect of it too. People are take, people are kind of invested in the space they're in. They don't want you to fuck it up because they want to come back again, right? If I'm in Berghain and people are like, getting aggro i'm gonna stop it because i want to come back i don't want to hear when i go back home that suddenly the government did a raid in Berkheim and kind of shut it down i don't want that i want it to be a safe environment for everyone involved um that's specifically what i'd like to happen um but yeah a um, really interesting study i hope we get rec recapitulation i'm not sure it's gonna happen in the uk because i think we get babied here too often um we don't do, we're not allowed to have any kind of fun the government always steps in and kind of curtails our enjoyment for some rate shape or for some reason i don't know why but you know uh, it is what you can do i guess you the only thing you can do is kind of you know navigate yourself to kind of safe spaces where they encourage or they they provide environments where you can partake in such activities and then kind of keep those places to yourself introduce your friends to them and kind of make sure the community kind of treats you with respect and doesn't really fuck it up really that's only what you can do really didn't it? um i guess in that way shape or form um what else is next here da, 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 da. kim kardashian changes her name of kimono solution wear which again interesting um developments on that one uh again news that i think is you know when you know sometimes you know i get don trump gets a lot of bad press but i think the one thing that he's been um you should be given credit for is introducing the lex introducing fake news to the lexicon of culture i think um it really encapsulates a lot of what's happening at the moment with you know the stuff that we're seeing on social media the stuff that we saw with cambridge and cambridge analytica the stuff we're just seeing in general with the dissemination, dissemination of information overall the fact that there's no unified truths anymore the fact that everybody's feelings take over the feelings of people um are more important than the facts of the situation the fact that some people interpret law um as uh somehow um you know did you remember do you see that um recent controversy with that makeup artist we probably didn't but the makeup scene is full of drama there was a, a makeup brand that supposedly was doing a competition on twitter or something on the current land right they put out a competition like, oh retweet this and you enter this competition to win i don't know a foundation 
And then in the tweet, it had the terms and conditions, right? Just briefly terms and conditions. You must be a US resident, blah, blah, blah. And then somehow in the in the next line, it has something along the lines of legal US resident, right? And then it kind of continued on. And everyone kind of flipped out. Legal? What do you mean by legal? This is ridiculous. I'm not going to support this brand. Um, you can kiss my legal ass, blah, 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 all that sort of shit, right? Um, so everyone was kind of, you know, quick to cancel a brand because they dared to say you have to be a legal US resident to enter the competition. Finally, it kind of came to pass that a few other drama channels posted other tweets from other companies also doing competitions that also stated the same sort of thing, right? And then everyone's had to kind of walk back their thing because it wasn't them taking a political stance and standing with, you know, Trump in terms of, you know, kicking out illegal aliens. It was just like a, a legal term that was used in competitions, T's and C's. Everyone has it, right? You have to be a legal resident to enter the competition, standard procedure. Um, and again, it, got, it went to show you just how ridiculous everything is getting, right? Where you can't just... You can't go by the letter of the law because even the letter of the law is somehow discriminatory. So it comes back to this Kim Kardashian thing, which, in my opinion, seemed like no news at all. It just didn't seem like news. It seemed like they were trying to make this a thing when it isn't a thing. And the odd thing that I think about is, I think for most people that study marketing or branding, the weird thing about the Kardashian thing or in media is that I get the feeling, especially with the Trump in well in some regard, the more they keep talking about people that they don't like, right? Pointing out their indefic their in their deficiencies and the things that they do wrong and how they didn't say that right and blah blah blah. The more that they think they're gonna be able to, you know, tear their house down and kind of um humble them in some regard, shape or form. But in King Kardashian's case, right, the Kardashian clan, they've essentially been able to carve a career out of the attention economy, right? They can they have some they have an uncanny ability to garner attention, to always make them to always put themselves in the headlines, whether it's by their own design or by you know, just some, you know, being a little bit naive or whatever it may be, but they're able to do it, you know, all the time, consistent, consistent, whether it's babies, whether it's names, whether it's clothing, whether it's business deals, whether it's perspective on life, whether it's prison reform or releasing convicted felons early, whatever it may be, they, 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 they've found a way of putting themselves front center of things all the time. Some of it's sincere, some of it maybe not so sincere. But the issue that I have with it is that the media actually think this is an actual cool way of destroying somebody and i don't really think it is i think they really fool themselves into thinking that the more attention they give to kim and the more that they point out her vapid nature and the fact that she somehow does things for the money only and for attention these kind of things that somehow people are going to finally wake up and think oh kim kardashian is an evil person that isn't true i think the beauty and the strength of kim kardashian and the whole kardashian clan is that they've been able to be successful out of being completely them themselves right they don't they never have presented themselves in any way other than who what they are right valley girls who are very much into their image very much into their family very much into materialism very much into that kind of hollywood lifestyle la lifestyle right the lifestyle a lot of people kind of are probably let's say maybe ashamed to say that they're infatuated with they wouldn't necessarily want to say it out loud because maybe it would make them seem a little bit hollow but you only have to look at the success of love island to see that people do quite like peeking into that kind of lifestyle of someone that's only about you know they only live for the materialism and for the moments right you only have to look at jordan woods um rare table talk um listen to that to kind of hear how kind of you know lacking the substance that kind of life is but it's also entertaining right because it's you said oh we would just be young and having fun and living in a moment right that's all there is to them right everything's a moment and you can see how it is by the pictures they take right they're very much pouting and posing and trying to create these moments that you can kind of look back on time and think wow do you remember when we were here and there and doing this sort of thing so anyway this story goes that kim, kim kardashian basically launched this line of solution where essentially a, a spanks that she sort of launched that kind of you know case of women who kind of want to wear dresses or wear certain sort of outfits without having to put on you know dowdy underwear a cool concept something has been done already previously but again packaged in a kim kardashian way done very well very minimalistic approach kind of um, expanding on the kind of easy sort, sort of stuff and again just create another great revenue stream for people that like that sort of thing and again if you don't like it just don't pay attention to it but i don't i think nowadays that doesn't exist there is no such thing as if you don't like something don't pay attention to it people just pay attention to everything like everything it's just bizarre i've never really understood that sort of thing and i guess my even on my tiny platform I'm only going to talk about stuff that I like or stuff that I'm interested in or stuff that's kind of made me curious or stuff that's kind of going to got a reaction out of me. But I'm not going to necessarily sit and waste time tearing somebody down for something that I don't necessarily think that is beneficial or that has any sort of... Not beneficial. I'm not going to sit here and kind of tear someone down just because I don't like their thing that they do. I'm just not going to pay attention to it. And the Kim Kimono thing was something I didn't really get. Again, she launched this um, essential line solution wear thing. 
Um, it went very viral. People liked it because of what it looked like and the kind of application of it. It kind of came off the back of the full body makeup thing. Again, if you're not really a fan of it, just don't pay attention to it. But again, she named it Kimono. The social media got outraged by it. Um, somehow, it raised up a really interesting conversation behind people not trademarking well-known names or phrases. So in this whole era, and it, I guess, you know, Kim Kardashian launching a brand like this and putting it into public, the, the normal process that you trademark the name Kimono. Um, obviously, Japan hadn't even trademarked it themselves. The trademark application went in. Japan minister of somebody something filed a motion against it or written her an open letter and you know throughout the social pressure out there and the fact that kim has now suddenly come into the good grace i think of most people i think aside from the flat tummy tea controversy the stuff that she's doing with releasing uh felons early from prison has really kind of garnered a lot of reaction from people in general because you no know, she doesn't need to do this she can just retire and live in her mansion look after a beautiful kid she doesn't need to do this sort of thing so the fact that she's done it i think she now probably in a position where she's like, you know what, I don't need the hassle, and she kind of caves really, um, which I, which I'm uh, disappointed with. But again, it's just a, it's such a non-issue that I really don't know why I'm even talking about it now. But you know, I, I guess it is what it is. Um, she put a post up on Instagram that said, "Being an entrepreneur and my own boss has been one of the most rewarding challenges I've been uh, blessed with in my life. Definitely agree. What's made it possible for me after all these years has been the direct line of communication with my fans and the public. Um, I was, I'm always listening and learning, growing. So I, if I, I so appreciate the passion and varied perspective that people bring to me. I announced the name of my shapewear line. I did so with much in." with the best intention of my mind my brands and products are built with inclusivity and diversity at their core and after careful thought and consideration i'll be launching my solution wear brand under a new name i'll be in touch soon thank you for understanding which is you know again i don't the public pressure thing i'm not really a fan of caving on people that are doing this sort of thing but again i understand she just doesn't want the hassle people are already coming for her neck in general um you had that jamila jamil girl again going hard in the paint about the full body makeup thing she had to then backtrack because people got in contact with her and said this isn't just a vanity thing it's actually like a confidence thing because there's girls out there that suffer from um eczema really aggressively and other kind of skill and elements who haven't been able to wear dresses in years because they feel subconscious so the idea of one day in the week or one day in the month being able to put on some short shorts because you covered your legs with makeup is really a cool thing maybe something that i will necessarily want for my own daughters but again that is not neither here or there because i don't necessarily have the autonomy to kind of dictate what any woman does with their body but again just a very interesting situation in general right you've got a, a family that has essentially made their entire business out of you know um the vanity and materialism of the world launching products that kind of you know lean into that kind of interest and then you've got the world reacting in shock and awe when they do something in that field that doesn't necessarily line up to their own perspective and stuff it's just like what's going on here man like they're always going to be around right just let it go you're not going to tear them down you're not going to cancel them they have their own fan base it's annoying as it may be but what you should be doing instead is propping up people that you like right propping them up if you don't like the kardashians cool prop up your person speak highly of the person that you think should be um an inspiration or a role model for females or girls out there in general it doesn't make any sense it's like the trump thing it's just a bizarre way of really dealing with something like you know i don't know i i have again i'm just it just surprised me i live i live i'm from an era where if i don't like something i just don't talk about it like you know it's like that it's like food reviews it's like um, restaurant reviews now in uh, for the most part in the uk just in general how many times have you been to a shitty restaurant and how many times have you gone up to mandarin and complained about the food none zero i've never done it right what you do is you vote with your feet you just don't come back again and then one person does that and then, you know, you might speak to your friend in confidence and he might tell you, hey, have you been to that place? And you might be like, oh, no, don't go with shit. And then that other friend tells somebody else, oh, my friend went there and he thought it was crap. That friend goes and he realizes it was crap. Then he tells their friend. And then word of mouth. And then so effectively you've got a business that, again, it's spy for the business because they don't, they have no idea what's happening and they're dying, you know, death by a thousand cuts. But that's where you, that's how I would do it instead of just besmirching somebody online. Like, that's out of order. Well, it's my own personal experience. I don't need to go and blast it to the world. People eventually find out anyway. Um, or an anonymous Google review might do the job. But yeah, it's just an interesting time where people are really out going out of their way to really tear people down for things that they don't like about them. Like, just keep it moving and just focus on somebody else. I don't really understand this sort of thing. It's just a bizarre way. There's always going to be a group of people out there who are going to love what they promote the collection. It just is what it is. Like, you can... It can be annoying. It cannot marry up to your moral or to your way of the way you view the world. But that that is gonna always exist. That that's just that's it. Simple as that. Let's just keep it moving, man. But I don't know. I guess you can't tell the people those kind of things. Anyway, um, we're fast approaching the end now. I need to start getting ready and heading off to the whole work 
situation. Um, what can I say here again? To I guess thank you for being back here again with me on the Excellent Zinger Show. Um, it's been a pleasure as per usual. Um, so much stuff to get through that I haven't got through yet at the moment. Oh, and the social social club is back. Um, they they had an interview with No Vegas Inn that's at, back now on online on the No Vegas Inn um SoundCloud. I recommend you check that out. A legendary interview with Neek. Um, he just launched a lookbook that just dropped recently when with, with an all female cast. Um, it kind of reminds me of the uh X girl. Is it X girl? You remember X? Is it X girl? X girl? X girl? What brand is that? Is that X girl? X girl streetwear. Do you remember back in the day that brand called X girl that used to be around? Um, I think it's X girl. Yeah, that's the one. That's what it reminds me. It reminds me of this X girl ads from back in the day. Um, I think they modeled it around there. Anyway, um. In legendary streetwear brand from back in the day i think they relaunched um as well it didn't really go that well i don't think because i don't really see people wearing it as often i'm not sure who relaunched it under the model of but this was back in the day um x girl um was a very seminal and interesting brand that people used to wear um yeah old school brand similar to this um that you used to wear but yeah that kind of shoot reminds me similarly of those kind of things um so yeah neek is relaunching um and so social club it had a very bad reputation in the beginning because of the lack of uh posting on time and stuff neek made a hell of a lot of money from the brand he's an internet legend a forum legend um you only have to kind of listen to the interview he had with nova gets to know that story is super interesting with how he kind of got started the fact that maybe the brand sort of like exceeded his reputation and he could have grown it grew so quickly in such a short period of time he wasn't able to kind of keep up or kind of maintain it in any sort of shape or way or form um did some really interesting collaborations and again just really made you question everything you know about a brand he maybe he was maybe one of the first sort of like merch streetwear brands right where they sort of you know back in the day streetwear was mostly a thing of like printing on basics then getting to cut and sew and then going into full streetwear that was the kind of progression that you did <coughs> with your collection um Nick really leaned into the fact that it was always about the classic, pe- the staple pieces, right? Hoodie, flannel, t-shirt, snapback, um, coach jackets, um, you know, um, what do you call it? Five panel caps, cotton ones, backpacks and stuff. Just the, the quintessential staples, he just kind of regurgitated again and again and again with labels with the same kind of font logo on it. Um, and that kind of maybe spawned the whole, like, you know... Um, uh, merchy streetwear brands that kind of came out after into subsequent years but again interesting um lookbook really cool i like the fact that you know they styled it with different pieces not just these own collections you know this girl here's wearing um og jordan 85s um jordan ones and also got a pair of vintage visas on as well that look pretty cool again very cool collaborations very i mean it's a very cool application of it i love i love this got barbie um and so social club club on the back there that's really cool as well flip on it again very conceptual streetwear logo flips um loads of puns and all that malarkey coming out very soon so i guess it's part of the relaunch that they're doing again i'm just to see how the business is going to be dealt with if they've got somebody actually doing the shipping and the all that sort of stuff that's i think i really kind of fucked them over in time because they were really popular and it kind of just dipped um the internet reputation kind of hurt it in the long run but again a really good um brand that doesn't need any kind of selling to kind of get it out there it kind of sells itself for the most part Everyone kind of ascribes to the anti-social, anti-social social club mantra for the most part. Everyone's sort of like, you know, pretending they're introverts online. So I guess that kind of leads into that. But again, I'm a big fan of it. I love Nick in general. I, I think he's an absolute psycho, uh, but in the, in the right way, right? We need more of a Nick's kind of personality in the scene. Uh, a little bit carefree, a little bit fun, a little bit manic. But again, able to create really interesting projects and really make you question everything that you know about clothing and more. Um, again, when's it meant to launch? Very soon, July 6th. Very, very soon. So I guess keep an eye out for that in that regard. Um, and Social Club is coming back at you with some new items. Okay, we're approaching the end now. I want to round it off to an hour because why not? You know, that's the way you do things here in the UK. Um, I guess well, um, I'll be um, seeing you guys again tomorrow. Hopefully, I'm going to wake up really early and do another podcast. Um, if not, I guess I'll see you guys this Saturday if you're around the um, the Leytonstone area for my night called Labertees, which is happening at the Heathcote and Star. I'll put the flight up here that I recently redesigned a little bit to kind of make it a little bit more interesting. So um, Labertees with myself, handsome black man, happening at the Heathcote and Star on the 6th of July from 9 to 1 a.m. There we go, the flyer there. I used to get the new flyer that wasn't the new flyer that I designed. That's the old flyer 
old flyer old flyer old flyer but hey that is what it is um i'll be playing from 9 to 1 a.m so definitely come around if you're in around the area um apart from that not much else going on with me like i said Bergheim ha happening very soon i'll definitely gonna do a video around that and get that out there for you guys to check out i've got some other video ideas i'm going to be making of in the next few weeks as well so check that out some stuff that i'm going to be some actual video content editing wise i'm going to be trying to put out soon as well to kind of make sure i kind of give this channel a bit of a chance um other stuff that i'll be doing as well um just kind of and watch this space really the working out is going pretty well too so i've got some interesting developments to kind of bring on to the back of that but again apart from that um i guess watching via youtube give me a like and subscribe um leave a comment if you have any questions anything i've spoken about that you thought was interesting let me know if you listen via the podcast app a five-star review will go a long way to really help the show get spread out there and if you're willing or if you're happy with what i do and you want me to do it more often you want to help out with camera equipment or that malarkey then you feel free to donate in the paypal link um in the show description too and i guess i'll see you guys again tomorrow for everything else in between contact me in all the regular places and i'll get back to you when i can and i'll see you guys again very very soon thanks again for checking me out um sorry about the improptitude breaking that won't happen again i'll make sure to keep this stuff regular and updated but again thanks so much for tuning in i'll see you guys very very soon bye